So I picked another little bit that I could read, but if that's enough reading, I can take questions. We're reading. Right, okay, we're wonderful breed of person who has the most wonderful job, and that's the media escort. So the media escort is he or she who meets you at the airport and brings you to your hotel and takes you to the bookstores to do stock signings and brings you to your reading. But they are also people who know everything about books and who have hosted the most amazing writers, certainly wiser ones than I. And my, reading, my media escort tonight, Brian, in the back, <laughs> mentioned this. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, mentioned this part of the of the book today, and I had never thought to read it, but I will. And if it's bad, you remember where he is. <laughs> okay, I'll skip around a little bit because this part is is um, a bit of a chunk. So at this point in the novel, Quigu is still with us is reflecting on the birth of his last child, Sadie. They don't promote naming in the NICU, as he discovered during his third year pediatrics rotation, that heartbreaking winter, 1975, with his mother just dead and his first son just born. If some ill-fated infant wouldn't last through the weekend, they discouraged its parents from picking a name, scrawling, baby, with the surname on the incubator label, ABC surname for multiples. Many of his classmates found the practice uncouth, a sort of premature throwing up of hands and defeat. These were Americans mostly, with their white teeth and cow's milk, for whom infant mortality was an inconceivable thing, or rather, conceivable in the aggregate as a number, a statistic, i.e. X percent of babies under two weeks will die conceivable in the plural, but unacceptable in the singular, the one grave blue baby, the late baby surname. To the Africans, by contrast, and the Indians, and West Indians, and the one escapee Latvian for whom Baltimore was comfortable, a dead neonate was not only conceivable, but unremarkable, all the better when unavoidable, i.e. explicable, it was life. To them, the non-naming was logical, even admirable, a way to create distance, from existence, so from death. Precisely the kind of thing they always thought of in America and never bothered with in places like Riga or Accra. The sterilization of human emotion, the reduction of anguish to hallmark card hurt, the washing, as by sedulous scrub nurse, of all ugliness off grief's many faces, faces quick beside me. To him, who could name grief by each one of her faces, the logic was familiar from a warmer third world, where the boy who tilts his mother, freshly bloodied from labor, fruitless labor, to the edge of an ocean at dawn, who sees her place the little corpse like a less lucky Moses, all wrapped up in palm frond and froth than walk away, but who never hears her mention it, ever, not once, learns that loss is a notion, no more than a thought, which one forms or one doesn't, with words, such that one cannot lose nor ever say he has lost what he does not to permit what he does not permit to exist in his mind. Even then, at twenty-four, a new father and still a child, a newly motherless child, quickly knew that. In the rancid delivery room, what's wrong with Iduwu? Where are they taking her? She clutched his bare arm. He was still in his scrubs, nothing else, arms uncovered. He'd been stitching when she went into labor too soon. A friend at the Brigham had had him paged over the intercom, and he'd run through the snow from Beth Israel here, with the swirling flakes clouding his vision as he ran, and the words, two words, clouding his vision. Too soon. It was too soon. No, not a human sound, animal. A growl rumbling forth from the just empty belly, a battle cry. But who was the enemy? Him, the obstetrician, the timing, the belly itself. Fulashade, he murmured. Quiku, no, 
Paula growled, her teeth clenched, her nails piercing his goose-pimpled skin, drawing blood. Quiku, no. Now she started to cry. Please, he whispered, stricken. Don't cry. She shook her head, crying, still piercing his arm, and other pierceable parts of him neither perceived. Kwiku, no, as if changing his name in her mind now, from Kwiku, just Kwiku, to Kwiku, no. He laid his lips gently on the crown of her head, her crown of glory full his hair, reduced by half by fresh sweat, a cloud of tiny spirals, each one clinging to the next in solidarity and smelling of Indian hemp. We have three healthy children, he said to her softly. We are blessed. Quiku no, quiku no, quiku no. The last one was shrill, nearing rage, accusation. He had never seen Fola unraveled like this. Her two other pregnancies had gone perfectly, medically speaking. The deliveries like clockwork, instructional videos smooth. The first one in Baltimore when they were still children. The second here in Boston, a C-section with twins. And now this, 10 years later, a complete accident, the third though they were all complete accidents, in a way. You have to do something. He looked at the nurse. A drinker, he guessed, from the paunch and rosacea. Irish, from the trace of a South Boston A, but no trace of bigotry, which often went with this, and gentle eyes, grayish blue, glistening. The nurse managed to frown and to smile simultaneously, sympathetically, while Fola drew blood from his arm. Where did they take her? He asked, though he knew. The nurse frowned and smiled. To the NICU. They walked down the hospital hallway in silence. His cameraman walked backward in front of them. In this scene, a well-respected doctor goes striding down the hallway to save his unsavable daughter, a Western. He wished he had a weapon, little six-shooter, silver, too, something with more shine than a Hopkins MD, and a clearer opponent or an opponent less clear than the basics of medical science, the odds. Presently, Oli, what is it? And seen, nothing, Kwiku chuckled, just tired, that's all. He patted his son's head, or his son's brow bone more accurately, his son's head having moved from where he remembered its being. He looked at Olu closely now, surprised by the height, and by other things he'd seen but never noticed before. The wide latissimus dorsi, the angular jawline, the yorba nose, Fola's nose, broad and straight, the taut skin, the same shade as his own, and so smooth, baby's bum, even now in adolescence. He wasn't pretty like Kande, who looked like a girl, an impossible, impossibly beautiful girl, but had become, in the course of one weekend, it seemed, a really very handsome young man. He squeezed Olu's shoulder, reassuring him, I'm fine. Olu frowned, tensing, the baby I met. What is it, the gender? Oh, right, Kweku smiled. It was a girl, then, it's a girl but too late. Olu heard the past tense and glared at him wary. What's wrong with the baby? He asked, his voice tight. The curse of her gender, impatience, Kwiku winked. She couldn't wait. Can they save it? Not likely. Can you? Kwiku laughed aloud, a sudden sound in the quiet. He patted Olu's head, this time finding his hair. His elder son's appraisal of his abilities as a doctor never ceased to amaze or delight him or appease him. His other son couldn't have cared less what he did, irrespective of the fact that they lived off his doing it. He didn't take this personally. At least he didn't think he did. At least he didn't show it when his cameraman was around. He was an intelligent parent, too rational to pick favorites, a man's man above petty insecurities, and a well-respected doctor, one of the best in his field, God damn it, whether kind of cared or didn't. No, he answered Olu, his laugh lingering as a smile. Olu's eyes lingering on the side of his face, then falling away. They walked farther down the hallway in silence. Suddenly, Olu looked up. Yes, you can. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. Kweku peered in. There it was, on the left. Three and a half pounds, barely breathing, barely life. With all kinds of patches and tubes sticking out of it, it looked like E.T. going home. Olu pressed his hands to the plexiglass window. Which one is it? He asked, cupping his hands around his eyes. Kwiku laughed softly. Oli didn't say she. Only it, one, the baby, little surgeon in the making. He pointed to the incubator, the handwritten tag. That one, he said. Baby sigh. It was the simplest thing, really, just the littlest slip. Sigh, speaking aloud as he tapped on the glass. But he'd been teetering already on an edge when it happened. When pointing to the incubator, he spoke his own name. And the two put together like combustible compounds 
The sound of his name breathed aloud in the space, and the sight of the neonate fighting for breath suddenly somehow made baby sigh his. It was his, she was his, and she was perfect, and she was tiny, and she was dying, and he felt it, felt this dying in the center of his chest. The force gathered, raw panic, overwhelming his lungs, filling his chest with a tingling, thick, biting, and sharp. He heard himself whisper, there she is, or something like it, but with the constriction of his larynx didn't recognize his voice. Neither did Olu, who looked up alarmed. Dad, he whispered stricken, don't cry. But Kwiku couldn't help it. He was barely even aware of it. The tears came so quickly, fell so quietly. She was his. That precious thing there with her toenails like dewdrops, her ten tiny fingers all curled up in hope, little fists of determination and her petal thin skin, like a flower that Fola could name by its face, Fola's favorite already, and she, waiting hopeful, still propped up in bed, sweating bloodied, his too. You have to do something. He had to do something. He wiped his face quickly with the back of his arm. The salt stung the wound there. He squeezed Olu's shoulder, reassuring himself. Come on then. Mm -hmm.